Good evening, and welcome to An Evening with Jasper Ford, author of Red Side Story. Um, yeah, yay, is right. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> Pretend like he's not standing off to the side. Um, we are delighted to have you all joining us tonight at the Stavros Niagara Foundation Library. My name is Allison Nellis. I'm a supervising librarian at Programming and Outreach here at SNFL. And I would like to thank the Stavros Niagara Foundation for making programs like tonight's conversation possible. Um, I would like to remind you that if you don't have a library card, it's easy to get one by talking to any of my colleagues at any information desk throughout this building. Um, and I would also like to encourage you to visit the New York Public Library's website for upcoming author programs just like this one. We have a really exciting season coming up of new nonfiction, music, and more. Um, and we would love for you to join us in this space again and also on our seventh floor. And for those of you that don't know, it's about to get really dark, um, the three public library systems in New York City are facing cuts of upward of $58 million to our budgets for the next fiscal year. Um, and if you have a moment, please visit investinlibraries.org to sign a petition to tell City Hall that by cutting our funding, you're making it harder for New Yorkers to live in New York City. Um, you can also do so, we have advocacy letters just outside of this area. Fill one out, put it in the advocacy box. We will hand deliver them to City Hall on your behalf. And it is now my pleasure to introduce tonight's guest. Turning paper is hard. Um, Jasper Ford spent 20 years in the film business before debuting, debuting on the New York Times bestseller list with the Iyer Fair in 2001. Since then, he's written another 15 novels, including The Big Over Easy, The Constant Rabbit, Rabbit, Shades of Grey. Ford lives and works in his adopted nation of Wales, and you can find Jasper on www.jasperford.com and on Facebook and X. Jasper will also be signing on this floor right after tonight's program. And now you can stop hearing me talk. You can listen to Jasper. Come on up. Well, I'm back. <laughs> hey. Uh, thank you. And I hope you enjoyed listening to that little bit of music as you came in. I, I recorded that earlier. Um, I, I come over here with my own group of musicians and we just record the music. No, I, I didn't, obviously. Um, I'm thinking of writing a book about great lies to tell your children. Um, I, I, we're trying, I'm, my son is like now 30 and he was saying something in the pub the other day and as, it, as if it was true. And we're, I, I'm trying to remember what it was, but I can't remember. And, and all his friends went, where did you hear that? And he went, oh, like that. Um, so, I mean, it's great fun telling children lies, um, you know, and the, the, but they're outrageous lies. Uh, one, I think one of, the, one of the ones that I really enjoyed doing, and I think, I think they probably, some of my kids got to the age of about 14 or 15 before they realized it was completely untrue, was about um, windmills. Um, windmills make wind, obviously, um, because when there's no wind, they, they're not moving. So clearly they make the wind. Um, they run on grain, uh, which, they, which they power by these two stones. And you pour grain into the stones and by some incredible um, you know, energy management system, you can actually change it into a motive power and generate the wind. And the very useful point of it about, about it is of the, the waste material can be used to bake bread. Um, so I, I tell them these sort of things and you know, just hoping they believe me. Um, it, it's great to be back, and, and thank you all for coming out to... Um, can you all see me at the back? Okay, are you all right there? Yeah, hooray! Yeah. Um, and thanks all for coming out. Now, who's, who's listened to me talk before? Oh, look at that. Oh, hello again. Excellent. So I can't do the same jokes I did last time. Okay. Um, so I'm here promoting um, Red Side Story, obviously. Now, this is the, um, the sequel to Shades of Grey, which I, which I wrote, f I think it was 14 years ago now, December of, uh, December of uh, 2010, um, a long time ago. Um, now, the reason it's taken, uh, first of all, sorry, it's taken so long. <laughs> um, the reason it took so long was that um, initially, I mean, it's, it's quite an interesting little story. Well, maybe not, actually, uh, but I've got to talk about something. So what happened was that my first six books, if you recall, um, were the first four Thursday Next books, right? And then I did The Big Over Easy, which was an, a nursery crime book, and I did The Fourth Bear, which was also a nursery crime book. Now, those six books, uh, my first six books, what were kind of not similar, but they had this sort of conceit that I was basically um, moving sort of well-known furniture around in your head. 
and doing amusing things with them. You know, it's like, you know, the three bears, you know, well, they were sleeping in diff separate beds. So there's obviously some marital discord within the bear family unit. And how could the porridge be at different temperatures when it was poured at the same time? I mean, all very relevant stuff. But it was essentially just, and then Miss Havisham, who drives fast cars, of course, you know, and all these sorts of things. Um, and, and, and I wrote those six books. And then uh, my uh, editor said to me, well, what are you going to do for number seven? And I thought, well, I've been kind of using other people's characters. You know, um, we say homage rather than steal, but it is basically stealing. So I thought, well, I better write a book with my own characters and my own situations. So what's it going to be about? Now, I write by a sort of series of tenants, which, we, which might pop up into the conversation at some point um, during the evening. Um, uh, and uh, one of which was, um, a, a, I write by something called a narrative dare. Okay, now I might have spoken about this before, but um, it's basically a narrative dare is you set yourself a problem, right? And then you have to write your way out of it. So if you've read The Air Affair, say, it's uh, Jane Eyre has been kidnapped out of her original manuscript. Everybody's copies around the world are blank from page 200 onwards, and someone has to get her back. Simple, right? That's the narrative dare for the air affair. It's quite simple. So for Early Riser, if you've read that one, the narrative dare for that was write a thriller set in a world in which humans have always hypnated. All right, simple. It's my only elevator pitch book. All the rest are very difficult to explain. <laughs> but the point about that one, a thriller set in a world in which humans have always hibernated, is the important word in that sentence is always, uh, because we're subtly different, uh, because we've always hibernated. Right. So that's basically a narrative dare. So the narrative dare with Shades of Grey was write a world order based entirely on visual colour. Right. So, oh, and the dare part of it is you can't back out, <laughs> right? So we're talking about dare. A lot of me sort of functions in this sort of 14-year-old me kind of world. And the point about a dare is that someone dares you to do something, like my big brother saying, I couldn't jump off the, uh, the garage roof, you know, and then you kind of have to do it, um, you know, and you spend three decades getting your own back, you know, by being better. Um, <laughs> so, so the point about a dare is that you can never ever not do the narrative dare. And the point about this is, and why it's kind of important, and how it really, you know, clues into how I write my books, is that some ideas I have are very, very stupid, right? <laughs> very stupid. And I want them to be kind of stupid but not silly. And you have to think, well, how am I going to tell this story? How do I tell a story about nursery rhyme characters being in a police procedure? Right? How do you do that? And when you've got the dare hanging over you, you have to rummage much, much deeper in the authorial toolbox to figure out how you're going to tell this slightly silly, stupid story in a way that is engaging and kind of makes sense and doesn't have readers going, ah, and throwing the book out the window. And, and, and that's why I think the dare part of it works really well. Think up a silly idea. Do not let yourself off the hook. So I've never given up on a project that I've started, no matter what, you know. Um, so anyway, so, so the narrative dare was, as I said, uh, a world order based entirely on visual color. Now, this is quite interesting because visual color, right, isn't there in the real world, okay? This, you know, very colorful world we see out here isn't colorful in real life, okay? So Back home, right, in any of your homes, your living room, if there's no one in it, there's no color in it, right, because there's no one there to see it. It's exactly like sound. It's a sensation, right? The tree falling in the forest, does it make any sound? No, of course it doesn't, because sound is something that we perceive. If there's a squirrel in the forest that can hear the tree, yes, of course it makes sound, right? If we all closed our eyes, this room would not have any color in it.
So I love this idea of this abstract concept that seems so amazingly strong and vivid to us. You know, this yellows, these purples, the reds, everything. Um, so that's what I did. So I thought, right, okay, we'll have the hierarchy based on uh, visual color. We'll have a healthcare based on visual color. We'll have a color based economy. It's just going to be visual color all the way down the line, right? So this was my seventh book. If we go back to where this tragic story of um, uh, uh, non-selling books goes, um, and I think what I'd done. So I really pushed the boot the, the boat out because I wanted to do a book that was really, really my own. In the same way that the air affair was completely my own. I mean, that was absolutely how I see the world. We'll go back a little bit um, with the air affair, perhaps, because my first two books I wrote were the Big Over Easy and the Fourth Bear. Now these were my conventional books. Uh, when I was trying to be an author. It took me about 13 years before I got published. These were my conventional books. These were the books I really thought people would want to, to publish and read, right? Not a bit of it. Not at all. Not even a sniff. In those days, you used to send, send out manuscripts and um, uh, an opening chapter, you know, begging letter, pricey opening chapter, and, and, a, and an envelope to send it back. It went by something called The Post, which younger members... Uh, of the you know of the group here may you may have heard your grandparents talking about this thing called the post, um, but sneakily of course, and I found out later that everyone did it, did this is that you stuck pages twelve and thirteen together with a pr little bit of Pritt stick to see if they read it, and then when you got it back you could have a look. They hadn't read it, right? So they didn't like the book. They didn't even want to read the first chapter. They didn't even want to read the seven seven, seven pages, and. But why, why I'm telling you this is not to, for you to go, oh, poor Jasper. It's, the point is that once I'd written these two books and I realized there's a great possibility that I wasn't going to be published, right? But I was still enjoying myself. I was still having fun with all these silly, wonderful, bizarre, weird ideas. And then I thought, well, if, if I'm not going to be published, you know, just sort of clicking over like this, you know, clank, clank, whir. If I'm not going to be published, it doesn't matter what I write, so I can write whatever I want with no holds barred. And that's where the air affair came from, right? This was just out and out silliness. And in the strange way in which things happen, that's the book that got me published. And it was because it was so off kilter. And if there's any um, writers here, who I'm sure there's always writers here, um, uh, don't write to market. You know, that's the biggest and best advice I can give to anyone working in the creative industries. Do your own thing. It's really important. Anyway, so ripple forward again to Shades of Grey. And um, so we published it, and it was like, Ray, new book, you know, Shades of Grey. And I went on a tour and everything like this. And people asked me questions about, you know, um, Thursday Next and Jack Spratt and stuff. And, and I realized that um, for many people, they, did, they wanted some of the same. They wanted more of Thursday. They wanted more of um, Jack Spratt. So the book did not sell particularly well, right? Shades of Grey. And, and it became a slightly unloved child within my sort of earth, if I can say that. Um, so we thought, oh, okay, well, maybe we shouldn't write the sequel. Maybe we shouldn't write the sequel. So I thought, okay, I won't. And we left it at that. And I went back to Thursday, and I did other books. I did The Last Dragon Slayer, and da di da di da Anyway, so there were fan letters. There were people who said they really liked the book, but it seemed quite a few people weren't buying it. However, about, you know, and I get sporadic emails, and you know, I just ignore them, these poor, you know, you know um, shades of grey, you know, people, just ignore them, you know. Um, and then... Um, but the emails kept on coming. And then sort of four or five years later, they were still coming. And they, people were getting sort of a little bit more annoyed and saying, Jasper, you know, when is the sequel coming? I really, really like it. And I'm looking at the sales figures and thinking, eh. um, and then And then it starts selling a little bit better. And then I get, start getting even more emails, you know, like people from saying, listen, Jasper, I'm going to be dying in 10 years. So I really like to have the sequel. So about seven or eight years afterwards, uh, after it was published, I suddenly realized this is, not an, uh, this is actually not an unloved child after all. And it's about time I wrote the sequel. So I said to my editor, uh, in the UK this was, I said, um, Carolyn, because that's, that's her name, 
Um, I said, I think I'm going to write the sequel to Shades of Grey. And she went, oh, my God, at last. <laughs> oh, you know, I, I, I wanting to know what was going on. And then, of course, I had the... the because I was write, starting to write about nine years after the first book, I'm going, God, what was, what was, what was going to happen? Because <laughs> I, have, I haven't written any notes. I don't write notes. I don't do sort of, you know, s silly things like that. I, I just make things up entirely as I go along. There is no plan, no plan. But, um, and this is one of these, another sort of central tenets by which I write, there is something called the no plan plan. Right, which is to plan if you have no plan. Um, and the point about that is that I had a rough idea where the sequel to Shades of Grey should go, but I didn't know how I was getting there. So I had to reread um, Shades of Grey about four times, make copious amounts of notes, rack my brains as to what I was thinking I was going with it, and then think, well, I think people are probably going to read Shades of Grey before they, they get back into it with Red Side Story. So do you know what? I think I better just carry on exactly where I left off. And that's what I did. I just, it's like two weeks past. So in fact, you've been waiting 14 years, but Jane and Eddie, uh, they've only been waiting two weeks. You know, it's time just stood still for them. And it was just really going back to the, uh, to the book and figuring out where I was going and saying, okay, I think I know where I want to go. Where am I going to take it and how am I going to get there? And it was really looking at all the things like, you know, the fallen man and the barcodes on your index finger and um, the swans and putting it all together and just saying, OK, the first book was kind of about um, Eddie. I, I kind of like Eddie as a hero because he's slightly... I don't know, slightly spineless and a bit ignorant, and he doesn't know what this world is, and, like, Jane educates him into how this world works and just how pernicious it is and how evil. Um, but I kind of wanted to turn the tables on Jane a bit, you know, for being a sort of know-it-all. And, and so the idea really started to form that, in fact, Jane should kind of take Eddie's position in the second book, is that she thought she knew what the world was all about, but she so doesn't. And, and it's like you're lifting a curtain, there's another curtain behind, you know, and, and the world is so much bigger than either of them could possibly realize. Now, I'm obviously not going to give you any spoilers here, but anyone who's read the book and might be nodding right now, then you know exactly where I, where I went with this. But it was also, um, I think, it, it was an interesting book to write because I also think, hopefully, that I become a more thoughtful writer over the last 14 years, and that I'm clearly a slightly different person, I think, and I think my writing maybe has evolved a tiny little bit, certainly with things like uh, with Early Riser and The Constant Rabbit. Uh, the Constant Rabbit, which if you read, uh, that's what I call my Brexit anger book. Yeah. Um, so I, I thought, okay, I'm, I'm a different person than I think with, with Shades of Grey. So what I have to do is I have to write a book that is very much within the tone of what I was doing 14 years ago, but links in to another slightly, perhaps more thoughtful way of writing. So there was a kind of subtle, perhaps subtle dark art to actually taking Red Side Story and running with it, but also sort of subtly changing... Um, the characters as well, because um, the the sort of uh, um, the evil doers in it, um, the antagonists, uh, Bunty McMustard, Violet De Mauve, um, uh, Sally Gamboge, they're all pretty unpleasant. Um, but I kind of felt that it's too easy to make people just unpleasant. So I, as you read it, or if you have read it, you'll you'll see that there is a slightly redemptive quality. Uh, about it, which I kind of like. And, and I'm always, w w you know, as, as writers and everything, we're also kind of always sort of stealing from, from you know, other, other sources. And I think the best way I can probably tell you is about um, when Jennifer Grey plays, um, plays uh, Ferris Bueller's uh, sister in Ferris Bueller's Day Off, you know, they, they sort of despise one another in that very, very typical way that you can despise a sibling. But when it really comes down to it, she's there for him. And she has this wonderful redemptive quality, which along with the, uh, the giggle when she's, you know, um, in, the, uh, 
in the in the in the police station at the end. So it, it's it's too easy, I think, sometimes to make people just wicked. So I, I like to bring in a, 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 a sort of redemptive quality. I think I think also um, you know, and it's it's uh, I I've um, and I you know, say this as, uh, I think probably, you know, quite a lot of people know about this, but I've been recently, um, I had to look after my mother who had Alzheimer's, right? Um, and that, that has resolved itself in the way that these, these things usually do. Um, but it was quite interesting, and anyone here who has dealt with uh, a close family member with, with dementia or, or something very similar, is that you have a plan, right, that works really, really well until it doesn't, and then you have a new plan. And, and then that can work really quite well until, again, there is another plan, and then you have a new plan. And, and I think when I was writing Red, Red Side Story, I wanted to have this idea come into it as well, that everything can be just sort of truckling along at a nice kind of rate, and then things change, right? And then you have to pivot, and you have to go in a different direction, and then it changes again, and you have to find yourself in another direction, and then it changes again. So you'll, you'll find as you, come th as you go through the book, or if you have been through the book, that I, I like the idea that I have brought into it about changing your plan because circumstances just mammothly change beyond all measure. Um, I should really read a little bit uh, from the book, but I don't know. I mean, you've you know, paid good money for it, so you can do that on your own. But... Um, uh, I should read maybe a little bit of something. Um, and I can, I've also got some notes here. Hold on, I've, I was just writing down. Yeah, no plan plan, the narrative dare, logical progression of an idea. That was another one. Less well-trodden path. Um, do you make uh, words up? I mean, I love making words up. You probably know this if you've been following my reading. Um, and I make uh, lots of words up in the hope that they'll be adopted and then they'll find their way into the OED, right, the Oxford English Dictionary, and then at Trib, Jasper Ford for the first usage. You see, I've been trying to do this. And, and so I'm always introducing new words in the hope that they get picked up by you guys uh, and it, it finds its way into the OED. And that hasn't happened yet, which is your fault, clearly. <laughs> um, not mine. Um, so, you know, we, we tend to, we tend to uh, call things in, in our house by very different names. I mean, spanners. You know, cutlery are, are spanners. You know, put the spanners on the table. I mean, it's very simple, isn't it? Uh, we have something called a dog warmer, which um, you might know as a uh, wood-burning fire. Um, but just recently, um, because I have two teenage daughters who are very demanding when it comes to um, needing to be places because they don't drive, so I'm, I'm basically Duba, a Duba service, which is Dad Uber. Um, and when you don't have Duba, you've got Muba. And if you don't have Duba or Muba, you have Gruba. So we've got Duba, Muba, and Gruba now. So uh, if, you could, if you could adopt those I'd be, and really start spreading them around, I'd be very, very grateful because that OED would be a, a way to, let's say, uh, find a way into, you know, make my li life, my, make my a name live beyond eternity, which is what we all want, basically, isn't it? So, um, so anyway, um, just talking briefly about Shakespeare because we've got to raise the tone somehow. Um, now, interestingly, I mean, I, I, I sort of quite freely use uh, Shakespeare in my books, which I do like doing. But uh, in so many ways with my, with my books, they seem very, very strange and a bit, well, off kilter and silly and everything. But quite often, there's actually quite a sound reason why I do things. And, and Shakespeare is a good, actually quite a good thing to talk about because... Um, Shakespeare is very much a what I'd call like a standard candle. Um, it, it should be kind of the same, and when it isn't, it's not the play that's changed, it's the sort of social situation around it. So Shakespeare has been changing, and it changes for us constantly in the real world. But in my books, the way I, the way I present Shakespeare is very much within the logical construction of the book. So if you cast your mind back to the Richard III audience participation play in the air affair, right, that makes complete sense within Thursday's world. And it's actually really a bit of just a bit of sort of um, exposition, if you like, to, to show you what Thursday's world is like. So also um, Shakespeare appears in uh, Early Riser and Shakespeare plays there are obviously predicated on the fact that Shakespeare would have hibernated. So again, it's sort of, 
I, I morph them so that they make sense within the world in which they're sitting, the book within their sitting. And, and of course, um, Shades of Grey doesn't, uh, doesn't get away with this, um, does, is, is not, is not uh, excuse this. So um, alluded in the first book, and I, and I often allude to ideas, again, it's these sneaky little tricks um, that really tie into the no plan plan, that I can't really sort of come up with a weird idea straight away. So it kind of helps if it's been seeded earlier. So I'll quite often say things in previous books because I know I want to use them later and I don't want to just bring them from stage left so they're, they're all very surprising. So you may have noticed that Neanderthals get a look in right at the very end of the air affair because I wanted to use them in book two but I didn't want it to be unusual, right? Because in these worlds, in fantasy worlds, they're not fantasy worlds to the people in them. They're very, very ordinary. You know, Eddie and Jane don't, doesn't, don't think they live in a particularly bizarre world and Thursday thinks it's completely normal what she gets up to. Um, so it's so it's kind of kind of important. So I did actually mention Shakespeare because uh, we, uh, they do perform West West Side's Red Side Story, and it is mentioned in the previous book. Um, so I thought, well, let's exploit that a little bit. So I'll read a little section here about a group of travelling players who arrive in East Carmine to do some little uh, a play, um, which is which is called. Uh, um, it's called The Tragedy of the Chromatically Non-Compliant and Clearly Idiotic Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> um, so it's, it's, it's quite fun. But anyway, um, I'll read a little section. What are we how are we doing for time? Oh, we're pretty good. Okay. Yeah, I do like questions. Get thinking about questions. Questions are great. Um, but not... But not uh, um, children are good. Uh, I, d I did a whole series of children's books, uh, the Last Dragon Slayer series. So I did a lot of school visits, right? And I did that, you know, any question, ask me anything. And there was this, this little boy at the back. And he, you know how they put their hand up? Like they really got a really important question. It's like, usually how much money do you make? They, they like that one. But this one wasn't. It was, yes, yes, I've got a question. And it's like, yes, yes, what's the question? And he goes, uh, what's your weight in kilos? <laughs> I thought only children ask those sort of questions, you know. Um, anyway, anyway. Um, the troupe started off with a short supporting play about how the continuing hunt for scrap colour was essential and the players mimed the mining and cleaning and sorting that were essential to the colour-based economy in a comedic manner that made everyone laugh, which I suddenly realised was rarely a communal activity. It was something you did in ones and twos or only out, and only out of earshot of prefects. Frivolity, Munsell wrote, is the bedfellow of indolence. After that, there was a warning farce against passing oneself off as a greater hue, with, with a pompous fellow getting into all kinds of difficulties by insisting his social station was higher than it actually was. Despite the obvious meaning and function of the play, it was actually very funny, with everyone laughing uproariously, especially, especially Mrs. Lapis Lazuli, who choked on a biscuit and had to be taken away to recover. Then there, were, there was then a colour-based quiz show that challenged individuals to name all the 78 r red hues in order of colour and intensity, which was won by Lucy Oker. And after that, there were some amusing monologues, a skit about a small child who dodges the Otavio, only to be eaten by megafauna after straying beyond the outer markers, a cautionary verse about the twin dangers of swan attack and lightning, a short vignette extolling the simple elegance of monogamy and another warning that although you know could be purchased from the riffraff for as little as half a cabbage, the certain outcome would be a large and painful wart that might damage marriage prospects. And then, with a drum roll and a parental advisory warning, the main event began. The play was a full three-act production, although I'd heard about it and performed in the musical Red Side Story, upon which it was based, I'd not seen it before. The players began with a monologue. Two households opposite in colour, in fair violetta where we lay our scene, from ancient and very wise taboo breaks to new stupidity, where uncivil hues make civil hues unclean. From forth the fatal loins of these two hues, a pair of idiotic lovers ruin their life, the better book of Munsell's rules does punish them both with the prefect's strife. 
Now that I was thoroughly aware of the collective's pernicious hold on pretty much everything, I thought I wasn't going to enjoy the play. But I did. With a titum 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 sort of rhythm to the speech and a clear, clear and fluid understanding of drama, the tragedy of the chromatically non-compliant and clearly idiotic Romeo and Juliet was oddly hypnotic and powerful. Clearly the intention, as it depicted in unambiguous terms what happened when complementary colours ignored the social stigma attached to opposition and indulged in behaviour considered quite outside the bounds of polite respectability. So a little idea there about, the, about uh, what, what I do with Shakespeare, which I think is kind of fun. It, it's kind of a... I mean, rereading it, it was kind of a dark book, and I don't know whether it's more of a now book than a then book, but um, I don't know. Anyway, um, let's have some questions. Let's have some questions. Yes. Over here. Hmm. What's going on in the rest of the world? Oh, okay. I'll, I'll, re I'll do them back. So, so. Okay, so that was a question about a sort of dystopia. Um, th this is basically, basically a, a set in a dystopia after a something that happened and what's going on in the rest of the world. Okay, read the book. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, th this, this it shows that where I went with the sequel kind of works because I'm answering the questions that you really want to know. What in heaven's name is going on. This isn't the full story. There must be more. The swans, they're clearly not swans. They kind of look a bit dronish. And if they're dronish, then someone's got to be controlling them. The fallen man, right, fell to earth 13 years ago, right? Where did he come from? There's something else going on. Uh, all I can say is, um, yeah, r read the book and all shall be revealed. Yeah, but um, yeah, without any spoilers, without any heavy spoilers, I sort of can't really say any more of that. But yeah, I mean, your your needs were my needs uh, for writing the book. You know, is just more. We want to know more. We want to know more. Um, right? Yes, at the back. Um, in terms of influences on your writing, hmm. Um, influences, uh, yeah, so sort of where do I get my influences? Um, this, is, I mean, it's a good question, and, and it comes around obviously quite a lot. I mean, basically all questions are variations on wh where do you get your ideas from. Um, uh, and, and usually the, the question is, and it was, you did mention um, E. e Nesbitt, um, and uh, quite often my, I'm asked, you know, which, which books do you use for inspiration? And, and I always say, if, if I just look to books for inspiration, or if an author just looked for books for inspiration, I would be selling myself woefully short. There's inspiration everywhere. I have this saying that I say to my children, and, you know, really annoys them, as I'm a very annoying father, as you might imagine. Um, and I say there's treasure everywhere, you know, which actually I think comes from um, Calvin and Hobbes, um, which is right, and there you go. You know, if you, if you want inspiration, read Calvin and Hobbes. You know, it's just fabulous, you know, from a philosophical point of view. Um, you know, this isn't a five-year-old boy. It's something quite different. It's like the, the human condition, you know, made simple yet inutterably more complex. You know, it'd be very, very difficult to really put your finger on why Calvin and Hobbes works. Um, but I take it from everywhere. I mean, literally, when I'm walking down the street, this, this morning I had to go from 31st down to 17th. And, and because it was a hot day, and uh, I haven't actually seen the sun. I live in Wales. We haven't, when we see a big glowing object in the sky, it's like we, we all cower in fear, you know, that the world is coming to an end. It's like, no, that's the sun. We just haven't seen it. Living in Wales is like living in Tupperware, you know, for six months of the year. And it's Always raining. It was raining for every single day for two months, right? So, I mean, the place is like a huge green sponge at the moment. But I was, I was walking down the street, and of course I was, I was walking, and it's, you, do the, you guys must do the same, because it obviously gets quite hot in New York. 
And, and you, you're on the shady side of the street. And I'm walking down there, and I'm just stopping in the shade. And, you know, when, when the red hand comes up, and I, I step back a couple of paces to stay in the shade of the, of the buildings. And then I'm suddenly thinking, do you know what? Actually, I think if you, if you had an issue with thermoregulation, right, it could be quite a dramatic story to try and get across, a, 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 you know, from 31st to 17th without thermoregulation. And I'm, then I'm thinking, well, the book I'm writing at the moment is Thursday Next 8, right? Yes. Um, and the day players from book 7, right, that Thursday, you know, was actually in the day player, they can't thermoregulate. So I'm thinking, okay, this is why I love fantasy, because you can create drama out of completely new ideas. You know, who writes thermoregulation dramas? No one, except me, you know. And this is what's exciting about writing in this kind, of, this kind of genre. And that's what I mean by getting inspiration from everywhere. I'm literally walking down the street to go and visit my publishers, Soho Press. Wonderful, wonderful people. Thank you, thank you so much for getting, getting me back here and rehoming me in, in the States again, North America. Um, so that's where, I, you know, I get inspiration from everyone. I, I overhear things people say to one another. I'm a terrible earwigger. You know, do you use that word, earwigger? Yeah, maybe not. Um, uh, yeah, listening to, to people's conversations, which are incredibly random sometimes. So it's everywhere, and it's from TV, and it's from comedy, it's from books, it's from, you know, cartoons, graphic novels. I just love all of that stuff. Um, so I just take it from absolutely everywhere, you know. Yeah. Um, yes, Yeah. I was really struck by how subtle the world building was. That, mm. um, it was dystopia where the, something that happens in the city seemed intentionally optimistic and obscure. Mm. Um, and I guess I was wondering what drove you to, instead of pointing the spotlight at what's different, point the spotlight in for all that happened 500 years ago, how do we do things now? Yeah, I mean, th yeah, this is all about the world building and, um, and a really about not talking about the thing that happened. Now, most dystopias are really kind of just after it happens because that's where the drama lies, you know, and it's a, like, it's, it's an easy way to have dramatic, you know, it's, uh, it's life on the edge, it's Mad Max, you know, and Furiosa has just come out, hasn't it, in the, in the, in the cinemas, which I, which I do like, I would like to go and see. I, Mad, Mad Max 2, uh, Road Warrior, is up there, you know, in my top 10 movies, uh, which is a very strange mix of films. Um, but um, going back to my tenants by which I write, um, another one is the less well-trodden path. And whenever I have an idea and I think, okay, uh, for instance, you know, where are we going to set the Thursday next books? Right, is it going to be London? And it's like, nah. Is it going to be Edinburgh, Glasgow? No. Less well-trodden path. Swindon, right? Now Swindon in the UK is is a kind of a kind of a joke, bit of a joke town, and then the well-trodden path would be treated as a joke town. No, we're going to actually treat it as though it's this you know amazing place where nothing can't happen, and and basically that's what I do whenever I run with an idea that's that's gone before, and especially when it comes to dystopia. Okay, is it going to be just after this this event, this something that happened? No. Let's go down the w less well-trodden path. Are people interested in the thing that happened? No, because it's been 500 years before, 496 years, in fact, before. Um, so the less well-trodden path is actually, I think, very useful because, as the poem suggests, you know, you come to a fork in the, in, in the woods and you take the less well-trodden path. Now, if you do that five or six times, you look down, you, you're not on a path, and then you've gone somewhere original. And that's also, you know, what I think we should strive to do within, you know, fantasy, this kind of, this kind of thing. So, uh, so I thought, let's, let's have it, let's have these people who are very incurious about what happens. And in fact, the, the regime that seems to be running the Shades of Grey world is actually wants you to be incurious. It wants you not to ask questions. And then we start, we start then blundering into, not blundering, perhaps, wrong word. Then we start moving into a satirical, the satirical side 
of the shades of grey world and how we can compare it to our real world and why satire works in the way that it does. But no, it was just I decided that I didn't want to do that. And, and if it had been 500 years, I mean, what happened 500 years ago in the UK? Let's think. I mean, we don't talk about the, you know, well, no, British Civil War, English Civil War. That was, that was 17, yeah, 1760s. Uh, no, so 1650s. So, yeah, be talking sort of about Henry VIII, I suppose. It's not something we talk about around the dinner table, you know, you know moving from, you know, Catholicism to Protestantism. It, it's not something we chat about in general. And, and it just made it slightly more real, I think. You know, but anyway. But thank you for saying that about the the subtleness of the wor world building. Um, I, again, one of the things that I wanted to change. Uh, Rereading Shades of Grey, I, I was I was um, I was sort of not thrown, but I was I thought there's an awful lot of um, a lot a lot of world building in here, and I think I need to pull back on that. And that's something certainly I think I've learnt over the last you know ten or fourteen years. In that you could probably read Red Side Story on its own and figure out that how the world functions without a lot of extra wordage. Um, so it's, it's a lot leaner, I think, as a book. Uh, right, more questions. So we, no one at the front here. Yes, sorry, at the, yes, right, let's, 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 let's ask you. Yeah, just kind of going back briefly to your, um, your interest in Shakespeare. Um, one of the things that I love about Shakespeare is that it's so referencing. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so you like the Easter eggs? Yes. There's lots of Easter eggs in my books. Um, I I like putting these in because some of them are very obscure indeed, um, and I I have a I have quite a good memory for these sort of little things. Um, and when I put in Easter eggs, it's kind of when you, because when it, if I find an Easter egg somewhere, it's actually ah, just for me. I mean, that's why they're called Easter eggs, because you found them, and it's like, oh, I found that. You know, it's hiding, and I found it, and it's mine. Um, and I th and I think there is an uh, there is an excitement about that, that, uh, and, and 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 a connection. You know, it's a world you understand because this is a world that I love. You know, and my my world is very much you know Star Wars, the original three, obviously. Um, are very much part of, you know, my, my upbringing. And, and, you know, I remember seeing it for the first time, you know, uh, when, you know, the original one came out in 77, I was uh, 16. And it was, it, was, it was difficult to say just what, a, what an exciting event it was, you know. And you come out of Star Wars in 77, you know, wondering if I'd ever see anything quite as good as that again, you know. Um, so I, I do like putting those little references in and the Star Wars references, which pepper the whole books but yes there'll be a lot of references in there to other stuff that perhaps you 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 don't know um i think also another reason i i do that is because i i always have a mind for uh the future and future readings now um for anyone who hasn't read alice through the looking glass for a while might be worth a reread because when I read it for the first time, when I was maybe sort of nine or ten, it was just a sort of silly, absurdist romp, which is very much like the uh, um, Alice in Wonderland. Right, Alice in Wonderland does not have the depth of Through the Looking Glass. Through the Looking Glass is a very, very special book, and he allowed more of his philosophy and, and maths to come into it. And I'm making particular reference here to the, to the White Knight. And when I read it for the first time, it's like, oh, the White Knight's talking nonsense. Right. Then you read it again when I'm like 27 and I'm going, oh, no, the, the white knight is talking about meta language, that names can have names. Right. That my name, Jasper, could have a name that's Steve. That's just the name of the name. And he was talking about meta language. And that's what the white knight was doing. Now, I was understanding this book on a much, much deeper level, but the book had not changed. Right. Lewis Carroll is dead. Right. And he did not change the book in between when I was nine and when I was 27. I changed. Now, I think what's interesting, perhaps, about the Thursday books or, or any of these books is that you could read them as, you know, a kind of, you know, kind of switched on 18-year-old, you know, or a very smart 18-year-old or whatever, um, and you get tons of it. But there's a lot of illusion there, Easter eggs, that you won't initially get. And then hopefully, if you read the book again, maybe 10 years later, 
you know, or if you're a teenager when you read them, age 13 or whatever, and you read them 10 years later when you're 23 or even 15 years later, which you can do now because it's been out nearly 25 years, um, the Air Affair, you'll find something new and different and exciting that you hadn't seen there the first time. You have changed. The book hasn't changed. So I think there was an element of that that I wanted to bring into it. And, and this is about a kind of reader engagement, which is very much something that I'm trying to really, really build into Thursday Next Date, called Dark Reading Matter, by the way. Um, is, is this a sense of, you know, because readers aren't really inside the books, you know, that they're not part of the book in that kind of way, in the way that the author is not kind of part of the book. And I want to try a way in which I can actually, you know, get the push the fourth wall in such a way that we can actually engage, we can actually include the reading of the book and the readers of the book and the author of the book in the book. So that's kind of what I'm sort of doing with, with Thursday Next. But anyway, I hope that makes sense. But yeah, it was a good Star Wars reference, wasn't it? Yeah, and it's and, and it's not and it also I'm just going on about it a bit. It's not irrelevant to the plot. It's how they managed to get past a gatekeeper, you know. So anyway, so it's a bit of fun. Yeah, bit of fun. Uh, right, another question. Uh, uh, let's just go to the back because I had their hand up, and then I'll then I'll come to you. Yeah. Yeah, I I am I am. So this was a question about the audio book and uh, and how you you came to the books through the audio um, the audio um, um, sort of uh, route. Um, do I choose you know Do I choose the readers? Um, the the answer is is no, not really. Um, if they send me like a choice of two, then they want my opinion. If they send me a choice of one, then they just want a rubber stamp. You know, if people are offering you a choice of one, is this all right, or should we look for someone else? You know, would you like this food, or should I make you something else? It's not a choice. You just go, no, this is fine. You know, that's the polite way to, to do it. Otherwise, you're just being a pain in the butt, to be honest. Um, but I think the interesting thing about audio, and certainly over the last few years that I've, reckon, uh, that I've seen, is that um, talking to publishers, audio has done kind of the same thing for, for a long period of time now, and they're starting to push um, to change things. So the audio for the end of the, the last, last Dragon Slayer book, um, the voice of the protagonist, um, it's first person narrative, but that voice changes, the first person narrative changes. And they, they rang me up and they said, Jasper, we've been thinking about this, and we thought that maybe you should be that first person narrative, because that's how it's changed. And I thought, okay, now we're moving a bit with, with audiobooks. And I find out rather delightfully that they called me for the, uh, the audiobook uh, of Red Side Story and said, did I want to do the chapter headings? Yeah, and, you know, any, any excuse to get in front of a microphone, really. Um, so I said yes. And then for the, um, for the US edition, um, there's a bonus chapter in the book uh, for you guys. It does not appear in any other, uh, any other editions. Um, but for the audio... They said, um, well, we want to have a, a bonus chapter for the audio. But what I did with the bonus chapter isn't easy to do as audio, right? So it was really good. So the audio people said, well, you know, what should we do? And it went backwards and forwards. And I said, look, why don't I write a script for it? And we'll do it as a two-hander with a friend of mine, Brendan. And they said, OK, we'll book you a studio in Bristol, which is an hour's drive for me. And if you can go and do that, record it, send it to us, we'll put it in the audio. And I really like this with, with audio because they're really starting to, you know, push things a little bit and getting authors involved because there's just a little bit more there if you, if you can hear that it's me actually talking on the audio. So it's quite nice that, that things are shifting, I must say. I, I have in the past um, put in little sort of um, holorimic bear traps um, for the audio because as soon as I hear there's going to be an audio um, book, I go, OK, what can I do to really stuff them? Um, you know, in a kind of interesting way. So, so in the Thursday books, I actually had characters that in the book world that you couldn't pronounce their names because in the book world, it, you can't, it doesn't matter. 
You know, it's like in the book world, you can do tongue twisters because you're not really talking. You're in the book world. It's textual. Anyway, so I, I introduced this character called Mr. Grunks, like that, and some Zvulks, which, which can't easily be said. And I thought, ha, ha, that will get them. Um, and then I get an email, you know, saying, Dear Jasper, I wonder if you could just um, tell me the pronunciations, you know. <laughs> damn, damn. So I thought, hmm, okay. Right, I've got to get smarter with this. Right, I have to be really, really smart now because I clearly have not. It's audiobooks one, Ford nil, right? So I thought, we've got to at least get even. So then I did, a, in a later Thursday book, there is um, three character calls called Heard You, Tolkien, and Listening. Right, they're three characters. So Thursday says at some time, oh, Tolkien heard you, heard you and listening, heard you talking and listening. So it was a, like a holorimic double, right? And I did that just because that's the way my mind works. And they didn't ring back and say, oh, you got us, it's one each. <laughs> they, ju they just said it and no one realized. And until in fact, until I mentioned it here now, probably no one even noticed. But that's how my mind works. You know, and I just always sort of pop these, these things in. Um, yeah, anyway, but that's about audiobooks. Uh, where were we? Uh, yes. Mm. Yeah, so that was a good question, actually. Most of my books take place over like three or four days. Um, I, I think it's because... First-person narratives don't lend itself so well to big time jumps. If you're if you're doing a first person, if you're doing a third person narrative, it's much easier. You know, two weeks later or something like that. But I I kind of want them pacey, and I kind of like this idea that everything is happening in this like three or four days. So they generally generally do. Uh, the air affair happens over slightly longer, but. Um, but I, I'm always kind of asking, you know, well, well there must be something going on. And, and I just want to keep the sort of the pace, if you like. So um, in, the, in Shades of Grey, I think it takes place over about a week. And I think this one takes place over about four or five days, maybe a week or something like that. I don't know. I just seem to quite like that. So, so that's, what I, that's what I do. A lot, of, a lot of writing is kind of just finding your comfort zone and then just sort of getting in it and then sort of slightly pushing the sides, but, you know, remaining kind of within it, even if your comfort zone is just thinking up weird stuff about thermoregulation or anything else, you know. So, um, yeah. Um, oh, yes, sorry. Yes. Uh, can I ask Um, yeah, so this is comedy. There's a question about comedy in the books. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is, you know, I don't want to diss another, um, another sort of genre, uh, but I will. Um, so a human drama, for me, it, it doesn't have any comedy in it, right? Now, humans are very, very funny, especially when things get bad. You know, that gallows humour always comes out. And if you write a book that doesn't have comedy in it, it's not realistic. Um, I'm trying to think of a, a good example. Uh, okay, Blood Diamond. Do you remember the film Blood Diamond with Leo DiCaprio? It's not a funny film. This is not, does not rank up there with the, with the great comedies. But there was one particular instance in it which I thought was a bit of directorial and uh, script writing brilliance where he's, uh, DiCaprio is like, goes into the village where unspeakable acts of violence have taken place and there's just, it's a smoking ruin. And one of the only survivors is this really old guy. And, and he, they, he sort of looks at him and this old guy says, um, good job we didn't have any oil. And I thought, this is completely realistic. I mean, completely realistic. And, and, uh, and that's why they left it in, and that's why it's such a killer line. And it, and it, it doesn't make people laugh out loud in the, the auditorium, but it's, it's, it's the correct sort of thing that, that, uh, that, that I think is important to do. Um, I mean, I use comedy a lot more, especially when it's dark. Um, 
I, I, I like to think the world is a comedy, you know, I mean, obviously it's not, um, but I kind of want to think about the funny side of things always, even when things are very dark, and that you can be, uh, that you can find comedy in quite difficult situations, and sometimes it's a really big coping mechanism, especially when it comes to things like, you know, the, the Constant Rabbit and my Brexit Anger book. You know, it's actually quite a dark book, yet there's a lot of comedy in it, and I think that's some of the best way to look at something. Um, a really dark book on its own, I think, is very difficult to read. Um, so I always always feel that I should be putting the comedy in things. And, I th and people enjoy comedy, you know, and it makes it, I think it makes books engaging. And I, I just think it's really important. Um, sometimes I'm a bit silly. I do, I do, you know, worry about that sometimes. But most of the time I just, I like it, you know, fairly light. But it's, um, it's certainly, I think, a good way to present a book, especially if it's satire as well. So, yeah. Um, okay, we're still good. So we've got five minutes. Um, yes, over there. Hmm. There's oh, there we go. there's like eight books with so much to say about uh, within that world. When you're writing an individual book and there's so much potential, how do you know when to end and wrap it up? Is it <laughs> when you've you think that you're satisfied with like answering to that narrative dare? Is there something else? Ooh, um, when do I know when to wrap it up? The, 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 it's often said that books are, are never finished; they're just abandoned. You know, or or it's torn out of your hands. You know, I I have I have deadlines. You know, I mean, this is my only job. You know, I don't have a day job, and if I don't publish a book, um, I don't get paid, and my children start crying because they're hungry. You know, um, and and the dog looks at me in that little winsome way that dogs do when their tummies are rumbling. You know, and and I think, oh, I should have written that book. So uh, th there is part of that. Um, but but I think uh, I think it's you know the world building is 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 interesting for me. I approach books in a, an entirely sort of uh, in an odd kind of way. I mean, I'm trying to think. Sort of early riser is probably probably quite a good example. In that I wrote the world first, right? First I had the world. Then I put someone in the world, Charlie, who's in the world, um, and then I found in the world where the drama was, and the drama then um, made the plot. So the plot came last. And when it comes to ending a book, which is incredibly hard to end really well, I mean, you try and think of a book or a film that has a fantastically satisfying ending, and you're really then starting to think, you know, oh, yeah, which one does? I think it's why crime books are so popular, because they've all got a good ending, pretty much, you know. The, the, you know, someone is found out as a murderer and it all comes to an end and, and the scales of justice are once more tipped in the direction that we would favour as humans towards justice. Um, when it comes to writing fancy books, then it's a little harder. Sometimes I have a really good ending that really works. I think the early riser ending works. I think the constant rabbit ending works. Uh, the fourth bear works. They're crime thrillers. You know, the bad person is unmasked. They work. Um, the, the ending, I, c I had real trouble with the ending of Shades of Grey, which is why I cliffhangered it, you know. If ever you have a book, you know, and it's a cliffhanger ending, and right at the end of the book it says, you know, this story will be completed in, you know, the following volumes. That was the dumbest thing I ever do, is to say, you know, Jane and Eddie will return in two more books. I mean, really. I mean, I've done some stupid things in my life, but that really does rank up there. Um, <laughs> I couldn't finish Shades of Grey. I didn't know how to finish it. It was 130,000 words, and I thought, right, I think I'm just going to have to say, you know, to be continued, which is basically what I did. Um, I was I was much happier with the, the ending in, in this book, in Red Side Story, because I felt it really brought us to a point where, you know, the curtain has risen and we're gazing upon new and untold um, riches and strangeness and, uh, strangeness and wonder and we'll just leave you there, and um, we will definitely pick it up at a later time. But um, yeah, it is difficult to know when to when when a book should finish. But you, you just have to sort of play it by ear, like much um, reading and writing.
not much writing. Yeah. Um, good. Actually, that brings us exactly to half past. So thank you very much indeed for coming along and having listened to me. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, and um, yeah, and I'm very happy to sign any any books that you've brought with you. So thank you, thank you again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.